Welcome, everyone. Today, we are talking to Mayur Gupta, CMO of Kraken Digital Asset Exchange. Welcome, Mayur, to Techstars Alumni, and I very much appreciate your time and uh, for you to be able to share your journey with us. So thank you. Thanks, Alejandro. Thanks for having me. All right. I'm going to share. Uh, so just sit back for a second here. I'm going to share a bit on your bio. Uh, it might be cringy because I know a lot of people get a little cringy when they hear all the achievements. Uh, but sit back and uh, and then we'll jump into we'll get started on the questions here. So prior to joining Kraken, Mayur led a team of strategists, brand marketers and data scientists at Gannett, part of the USA Today Network. Within this role, he drove the company's transformation from a news media platform to a digital content subscription marketplace. He has also held key marketing leadership roles at Freshly, Spotify, Healthgrades, Kimberly Clark, and Sapient Nitro. At Spotify, he drove the vision and strategy to establish a connected marketing ecosystem for Spotify's two-sided marketplace that connects artists with users through programmatic discovery and accessibility. Mayur was also the first ever global chief marketing technologist at Kimberly Clark, one of the largest global consumer packaged goods companies. Throughout his career, Mayur has been recognized for his achievements within the marketing ecosystem by Forbes, Harvard Business Review, The Economist, and more. Uh, Mayur currently sits on the MNN. MMA Board of Directors, a marketing trade association that brings together the full ecosystem of marketers, martech, and media companies working collaboratively to architect the future of marketing. From his game-changing strategies at Gannett and Spotify to his visionary approach at Kraken, there's a lot to uncover. Let's dive in. Mayur, again, it's an honor to have you here. Um, thank you. <laughs> that was indeed cringe worthy and that was <laughs> um but i appreciate it let's i'm looking forward to diving in um okay so uh you've had incredible responsibilities uh across amazing companies and so i'll try my best to cover the insights uh from those experiences but let's start with uh kraken so kraken is a us based cryptocurrency exchange founded in 2011 one of the first Bitcoin exchanges listed on the Bloomberg terminal. For those who never heard of Kraken, who is the average Kraken customer and what problem are you helping them solve? Can you can can we start there just to paint a little picture for everyone? Yeah, yeah. Um there are there are three types of customers that Kraken has. Um one is, I'm assuming people like you and I will put put us in uh, regular consumers or retail consumers, or you know, which is we are not professional traders. We don't we are not doing that, you know, for a 24/7 job. But like me, I I got into crypto in 2017, got into a few ICOs, dabbled with a few things, and now now I obviously I'm right at the center of. Of something, so there there are um, roughly 400 million people in the world who are trading crypto, and there's one segment is people who are doing it for different reasons. You know, many of them have an investment thesis. Some of them could be doing it because they live in a country where uh, crypto is the only way to fight inflation. This is the only way to to mm. move away from the centralized power. So anyway, so that's one core segment. Um, so individuals. So Individuals, yes, like in and within individuals too. Um, these are people who are not professional traders, right? This is not what they do um, every single day, X hours a day. The second client segment, and this is not prioritized. But, uh, the second client segment are actual also individuals, but these are professional traders. These are more skilled. They're advanced traders. Some of them are doing it as a full-time job. Some of them are just more advanced. You know, they got into crypto early on, or even if they got into it late, uh, they just got into more advanced derivatives. Like in case of equities, there are some people who actually um, trade derivatives, you know, options and uh, and uh, margin calls, things like margins and so on. So um, we have we we have one of the most advanced set of products and and capabilities and UX and design on our platform. 
which is catering to the needs of more advanced crypto traders um, who are playing uh, or managing uh, their assets or they're managing uh, other people's assets and portfolios um, and they are they lean and index more on advanced trading products mm -hmm. and then the third segment is more corporates and institutional clients um, who have very different different needs um, underneath all of these they as you know in crypto um, there are certain things that matter more than others and at least in phases like this where security plays a massive role, client services play a massive role, um, your belief in innovation and building experiences that actually provide you all kinds of data and tools, um, you know, and um, and UX. So our journey, you know, we just celebrated our 12th year. So we are one of the oldest and largest exchanges in the world in terms of volume and, and client base. Um, we are um, we are not just focused on the U.S. market. Our one of our biggest regions actually is Europe. If you look at, you know, the mm. volume of, uh, transactions we have, followed by the U.S. and then then other regions in the world. And um, you know, the core of Kraken, the core part of our journey, actually indexed in the beginning a lot more on advanced traders and professional traders. That's how we started and we began. Um, but we launched our consumer offering in the last three and a half or four years, but we've scaled and really accelerated growth there. And uh, very excited about the next wave of crypto growth and crypto adoption as the markets evolve and get better. Um, you know, I personally believe that a few hundred million people in this next wave will jump into this incredible movement and technology revolution as uh, as we as more and more use cases and applications of crypto become ubiquitous as as more apps and platforms come out uh, and uh, we will see more and more application of it in daily life it'll bring the next wave of crypto users and and so we are all very bullish and excited about about that I love thank thank you for that breakdown. That's wonderful. I love how I love hearing when a company starts with a certain type of customer and then they are they're not just increasing the engagement of that customer, but they're they're widening their their scope to other audiences that could use this. So you mentioned it originated with pro traders let's say right people that that had a lot more experience in this and now in the last three years you've expanded it to a to a much wider audience to other individuals that don't fall within that uh professional landscape and you had you have joined kraken from from us speaking today from from this recording but you've joined close to two years now more or less, right? Something like that. Yeah, lower a year and a half back. Uh, but yes. Um, so this with... new, when you came in, uh, I love, I'm always fascinated with how do you approach prioritizing how to market Kraken's narrative or products, services, you know, you're, you're walking in, you know, you know, you're every day you're getting a, a, a new sense of, of, the company and its capabilities and all the benefits and what you're offering, how do you prioritize, you know, how do you approach prioritizing all of that? Yeah. Yeah. See, there, there are a lot of interesting things um, about Kraken, about our category and, uh, and other, what I like to call product led companies, because, you know, unlike let's say a CPG where you build a product, and then you lean on marketing to drive distribution and awareness and scale. In product-led companies, product is your first marketing engine. That's why when you look at a Kraken or a Spotify or a Google, um, marketing wasn't really the primary growth engine in the first phase of growth from zero to one. It was really the product, so it's product-led growth. It's intrinsic, it's word of mouth because you build a fantastic product, you prove product market fit early on, and then growth happens, you know, because you build a great product in a great market. And as a market shifts, you drive adoption. And when you build a great product, word of mouth becomes critical and product becomes your most 
um, accelerating marketing channel. Interestingly, in, in all of these brands, uh, marketing at scale gets established in the next phase of growth where that organic growth starts to stall or the competition becomes stronger. And that's where you now want to drive awareness and understanding and, and differentiate yourself. How are you different from the competitors? What value are you bringing? You're not diversified your product portfolio. So that's where we are. We are in our next phase of growth. Like I said, um, you know, we just celebrated our 12th year anniversary. And uh, marketing relatively is a newer muscle at Kraken. You know, all our mm. growth in the first 10, 11 years has been on the backing of a great product. You know, like like I said, we focus on a very niche audience. We optimize the product experience and, uh, and had tremendous traction. But now it's all about um, building and optimizing the marketing engine as a primary growth driver for the next phase of growth. And the reason why I said crypto is interesting is see, because unlike let's say even music streaming or, or take another startup in any other category, most of the categories, there is enough understanding of the category within the community and the world outside, within your TAM, right? In the sense that there is a problem out there that the world understands. You build a product that addresses that problem, that, that need. And then all you're trying to do is differentiate yourself, talk about what value prop you bring, engage in a unique way, build a great product experience, and you continue to grow. Of course, there's a, that's a lot. You know, it's easier said than done, but that's pretty much what happens. Um, in crypto, the world isn't just yet waking up saying, oh, I know the, there is a massive problem with the current financial ecosystem and I need crypto as my savior. I need mm. crypto. That doesn't exist yet. It's starting to happen, right? Out of seven and a half or eight billion people, maybe there are roughly 350 to 400 million people who jumped in. They're early adopters, even after 12 years, 13 years of, you know, mm -hmm. bit, bit from the time when Bitcoin white paper was published. So which means that as brands, we have to play two roles. We first have to drive an awareness and understanding of the category itself, why it makes sense. And the first wave of crypto marketing index too much on the solution, whereas the world was still, still searching for the problem it's going to solve. So as Kraken, we are firm believers in um, not letting the tail wag the dog, you know, not, not leaning in uh, with the solution, but we want to lean in with the context on the problem that, you know, that, that crypto is intending to solve and has the ability and the mission to solve uh, on one end. And at the same time, because we've never done marketing at scale in our 12 year journey, mm -hmm. then it's to establish the Kraken brand. Why are we unique? What is our soul? What is our purpose? What's our mission? So that's the intent first, but now tactically talking about how do you prioritize when you are you know, a newer muscle in an engine that's been running for 12 years, and has seen tremendous growth. How do you prioritize? How do you balance it? Especially if your audience are a lot of the tech start founders and, and growth leaders. See, I feel I feel the marketing engine, if you are if you're a marketing leader, you you have to believe that long-term sustainable growth is not is not a question of ors. It's not a choice between brand versus performance, uh, creative versus data science. Uh, purpose versus profitability. Today, marketing to be a sustainable engine, you have to apply both. But the challenge is, if you have $100, because a lot of startups barely only have $100,000, $100, right. how do you spend it, right? Because all the evolution in the last 15 years in terms of addressable market, access to 2.5 billion people on social platforms and through Google and the Metas and the Facebooks and Twitters, you want to spend all of it in lower funnel marketing to bring users in. So the way I think about that framework is very simple. You've got, as a CMO or as a marketing leader, you first have to move the needle. That's your oxygen. You have to index and maximize uh, the, the, the type of marketing that will bring new users in and do everything possible to engage with them, understand the behavior to maximize the lifetime value. You have to start there because if you don't have that, you don't have oxygen mm. as a leader. And you can only live without oxygen for this much, you know, maybe two minutes, five minutes, whatever. So transfer mm -hmm. that in. Okay. If you're only focusing on brand 
you maybe have a month and a half, two months until somebody will say, you know what, I ain't seeing the needle moving and this isn't working for us. So you first have to make sure that you have an oxygen supply, which I think is very tangible numbers. They have to move. And in organization where marketing is a growth engine, you have to prove that. But at the same time, you as a marketing leader also have a responsibility to know and educate and influence internally the fact that only oxygen is not good enough for survival. You now need nutrition and good food. The difference is you have a little bit of a longer runway to stay without food, which is your brand and, and your what differentiates you. That serendipitous relationship with your audience. And um, you can't live without it for too long. But that's the framework you need to prioritize. If you have 100 bucks, where do you spend it? And at what point do you now start to bring good food, which is your long-term resilient, sustainable brand? Because without that, if you only focus on lower funnel marketing and growth tactics, and if you don't have a flywheel to create new demand, very soon you're going to run out of demand. CAC goes up, competition increases, retention rates climb down, and you wonder, well, it was working well initially, but now the CAC has gone high. No one really understands us. The retention is lower because the only way you were keeping users was based on a very functional and utilitarian value. Mm -hmm. You had more. So that's how you, you try to do a bit of a balancing act. And it's the art and science of how you distribute that $100. How do you prioritize? But I firmly believe that in, in growth-minded tech and product-led companies, marketing and marketeers have to fight their way to earn the right to be at the table every single day. Mm. And uh, whether we like it or not, we have to hold ourselves accountable to move the needle and move the needle every week. Uh, there's no more six to nine months runway. <laughs> I like that. How how do you, I was just going to say, as a founder, that that is always one of the hardest things. How to test and when to pull the plug on on a certain campaign, right? Like how long is long, right? <laughs> do we are are we doing something right? Are we doing something wrong? And how long do you following up when you just mentioned there, uh, whether it's that example of a hundred dollars or whatever the case might be, how how do you go about under, figuring out? how much time to allocate to certain campaigns with certain channels? Uh, is there, is there like a, a best in class? Is there like a best practices? You know, when, when you're dealing with this uh, it's, you know, you want to stay to this when you're dealing with that, anything that comes to mind? Yeah. Well, first of all, there is no, there is no single um, silver bullet or one playbook that works for everybody. There, there mm -hmm. are so many variables the category, the competition, your own brand, where you are in the journey, everything. So there's so many variables to it, geo, target audiences, et cetera. But I believe more that as leaders, we need playbooks and frameworks that allow you to you know, test and experiment and check and adjust. But the way I think about it, first of all, um, I don't think that marketeers should think just in the form of campaigns. That is on the contrary, you have to first think about marketing as an always on engine, um, you know, that is constantly running, constantly incepting, you know, catching signals, understanding data, optimizing, testing, learning, experimenting, and executing. First, you've got to have something that is always on, evergreen, through the funnel. Um, that is your lower funnel efforts, your engagement and retention efforts, and then some mid-funnel, top-of-funnel brand, social content, all of that. So focus on that ongoing rhythm first. And then on top of that, because I'm, I'm sure based on your size and scale, you would have identified a core brand platform. What mm -hmm. makes you a brand platform that ties into your core soul, your purpose, your mission as a company? Basing everything on that, now you bring in campaigns which are responding to certain cultural moments which are responding to certain business moments or, or anything else, and then you bring them in. So it's almost like you have an engine that is constantly running day in and day out, and then you bring in every now and then this catalyst of a campaign, which is driven by a certain idea. 
Um, now, how do you know how long a campaign should be? Should you have to spend ten million dollars to know whether it's working or it's not working? <laughs> or so th there is no. It's very hard to pen down. I think what is most important is how you define stat sig, how you define that you know what this is good enough signal. This is good enough spend, good enough reach, and good enough period in your flight time to know whether it's working or not. What is more important is figuring out um, how best do you measure marketing efforts that are not very addressable and measurable on a daily basis, which is every part of marketing, which is not lower funnel performance. With a lower funnel performance fair, you spend $100, you know, by the end of the day, how many people clicked on it, how many converted, how many filled a form and became a lead. But everything else, which is more higher up in the funnel, and I'm using this, I know some people say there is no concept of a funnel, all of that, whatever taxonomy you want to use, doesn't matter. Mm -hmm. The point mm -hmm. is, there is a certain type of marketing which is harder to measure because it, you are distributing content and media on channels which are less addressable, less attributable. Mm -hmm. The challenge is, how do you measure those? Because that's those channels are also more expensive. You're buying a TV spot. You're doing an out of home. Um, you're, you're not doing, you're not having easy access to all that data. Let's say the ones that mm -hmm. yes, you you also don't have traceability. Somebody saw your ad and clicked on something. There is no addressability. There is no session. There's no single session. There is no click stream data, which is different from your lower funnel digital performance marketing efforts. So. How do you understand that? How do you measure it? That's where today marketing and marketers have to get smarter, more creative, you know, more hackish. On one end, there are there is good amount of uh, measurement technologies. You know, with um, um, you can do MMMs. There is MTA. There is match market tests that you do. Um, there are different types of methodologies you use to identify what's working and what's not working in a much shorter time frame. But also very importantly, you've got to identify proxy KPIs for your brand spend. You've got to find out proxy signals. They are not totally indicative of it working, but you want to find out if you're spending you know, $100 on brand, hey, I know that downstream is going to move my awareness and my consideration. But in the short term, can you check, are you seeing a lift in your direct traffic? Are you seeing shifts in your branded organic search? Are you seeing shifts in your organic search traffic? Are you seeing something else in your app store? Because those are early signals that you can correlate to your brand spend and see, are you seeing any shifts so that you don't have to wait for four to five months? By then, you've already dug a hole in your pocket without mm -hmm. knowing what really was happening. Are there are there particular uh, tools out there or things that you've come across that have helped you understand these proxy uh, uh, indication indicators? Yes. Yeah, so, yeah, there, there are a bunch of things. There are four different methodologies that our, our data intel and our growth teams have been working on. Um, we built our own internal MMM model that basically, you know, um, tries to address these blind spots in channels that are less addressable. Um, so we've, uh, we are testing that um, and we're bringing a partner uh, on board as well, um, you know, to, to do that. Mm. Um, in the past, I have implemented MTA, but that is becoming harder and harder, especially with, um, you know, challenges around, you know, the changes that have happened on iOS, the changes that are happening on cookies. So it's, it's making it harder, but, you know, there are solutions out there that um, that are coming up with new um, ML-based AI-driven methodologies that are trying to solve this for many companies. Um, we are also using match market tests, which is uh, if you happen to have geos that are very similar uh, in terms of uh, demographic and maturity, you know, different DMAs, even in the same country or multiple countries. Mm -hmm. uh, you continue to activate marketing in one and and uh, use the other as a control market and you see a difference. So there are things that you do like that. 
Mm. You do channel control testing. So you turn on a channel, you turn it off, and you see the impact. So there are different ways to to test incrementality of marketing. And um, there's no singular way of doing it because um, because it's hard. You know, the, the, yep. the media ecosystem is massively fragmented. Uh, the user journeys are not linear. And uh, there is no single click stream that will connect all the dots. So you have to come at it from different way, different angles, different ways to see truly what is incrementally driven by marketing. But that question of proving marketing's incrementality is absolutely quintessential mm. for marketing to survive in any organization, especially product-led companies. Is this, is this, would you say this is one of the greatest challenges for? Uh... Oh yeah. Yeah, absolutely. It, it is, it is one of the, um, the most interesting challenges to solve for any marketing organization at scale is to prove what percentage of growth happened purely due to marketing efforts or hmm. what percentage of growth would not have happened in the absence of marketing a hundred percent. What about uh, community building? You know, community audience, uh, community building marketing, like building those relationships, building that trust. Uh, are are there are there any initiatives, any any type of content, any type of programs that you're working on right now, Kraken, that that focus on that, on on fostering those relationships, on on building that community feel, that audience. Yeah, look, first of all, any good marketing should help build communities, should help drive loyalty, should help steer engagement through better habit creation. Any good marketing should do all those basic things, right? Um, but you just can you just can go and build a community because a lot of that community building at times is also dependent on what products you're building, right? What features you're launching. Um, because you know, you're not looking for another meta. You're not looking for another thread. Uh, there are enough communities out there. But in order for, for you to build um, a community of like-minded people, you also have to you also have to build product that where people believe that um, that the value they derive from the product itself continues to accelerate and get higher and higher as they bring their own network in, as they bring their community in, which is this network effects, right? Um, mm. So it's, I don't think that building communities is singularly driven by any single function. Um, I think the concept has to be, it works well when the concept and the experience is embedded within the product itself as well, which lends credibility um, to build communities because the only way you build a community is when when you get value out of it. Otherwise, why would you stay? Um, right. So it's it's very important to to think about it like that. And at Kraken, for, in, for instance, we are very excited about a lot of things that we are going to launch, but we launched our NFT marketplace um, late last year. And you know we publicly launched it earlier this year. Um, and um, that's a great place because we're bringing like-minded creators and um, you know collectors um and um and now we are starting to leverage and start to scale marketing to connect those uh, creators and collectors together um but because we also built a great product right that allows so the product to leads the product yeah. leads the uh, ta solves tackles that that urgency that necessity from both parties and, and when it comes to improving that experience between them, that's when that community factors in. Is this? Yes, yes. I feel that's more sustainable uh, and more realistic um, for. And are there are there current with that NFT marketplace? Are there current uh, current community building initiatives that have been because i i know that for founders that that have whether it's the also a marketplace or whether it's b2c or even b2b you know they're 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 spending a lot of time on on, on building those relationships on building that trust and and trying to 
uh, have uh, provide as much value as possible on top of the product, right? Um, so in your case, are there any types of uh, initiatives you've you've been you've been releasing or that that have you you've seen uh, already come into fruition that that have been pretty helpful? Yeah, yeah well, one one um, initiative which is an example of how you bring honest creative marketing on top of a platform like that. So we we are actually in the midst of um, our NFT contest that we are doing with our um, Formula One partner, Williams Racing, where we've actually, um, we are actually going to have uh, multiple NFTs on the rearing of the car, you know, during the Austin, Texas race. Which actually got... multiple NFTs on the on the rear view of the of the cars? The is that what you said? Of the oh, Formula on One? The, okay. On the on the rear wing of the Williams cars, the two Williams cars. Uh, not every not every uh, every car uh, in, during the race, but yes, um, but not not um, these are NFTs um, which were actually um, which were the winners uh, during the competition. We had. Um, you know, six winners selected. I think we may now have seven NFTs showing up on the car. Uh, some of yeah. them, two of them were actually handpicked by the drivers, Alex and Logan. Four of them were driven through voting on Twitter, on social. So that's how you rally a community around, you know, through we built a platform that brought like-minded people and creators who were looking for this breakthrough technology to you know, to um, remove the middle layer in in terms of the concept of NFTs. Then we built this great marketing idea with a brand partner, Williams Racing. Uh, the community really loved it. We got a lot of traction and we'll be sharing the data, you know, in the coming weeks. Um, and we're very excited about it and you will see it. And so that's how it's, like I said, it's not just, it's not just going, you know, marketing tries to do and build something but it all has to make sense. At the end, you have to have tangible value going back to the customer. <laughs> right. That's that's where the conversation begins. Uh, it, how about going back a bit with your experience with Spotify and while we're still talking about the building a community, with Spotify, you're bridging artists with, with users. Um, can can you share? Are there some insights from how you cultivated this connected marketing ecosystem and and some of the challenges that that you face there? Yeah, see, <clears throat> Spotify's first ten years were not about connecting artists with the users or the fans. Um, it was connecting the fans with the world's music. <laughs> um, that was the beginning. That was the first problem. Right. Uh, that Spotify sold and it sold incredibly well. Um, and then the second big focus area, and you can say second and third all kind of was happening together. But the second one was how do you then bring more creators, more artists to be able to launch their art in a more seamless way? Again, trying to kill the middle layers or trying to uh, not need the middle layer when it wasn't needed. Mm. Uh, the labels and every and and everything else. So that was the second phase to to democratize the process of producing music, distributing music, and and marketing it. But then somewhere in there has been this journey and and the effort to connect then the artists and the fans, and and that's very similar to what everyone's trying to do in sport. How do you bring the athletes and the fans closer together, which is mm. you know, the, whole, the whole ecosystem? Um, and, and that's what we were, uh, Spotify has done incredibly well. But examples, you know, when I think about what role did marketing play, like the more cliched now, but the Spotify ear in music, the Spotify rap campaign is a great effort where you're bringing, you know, hundreds of millions of fans all around the world much closer to um you know to the to the artists and um what they have done through the year what music they listen to in a very creative way using a lot of data to tell tell uh tell the story hmm. um and 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 bridge that gap and then there are a lot of features that Spotify has built over the years that 
that bring the artists and the fans together. Um, you know, and they actually look at your listening patterns, who your favorite artists are. They you get a lot of communication now mm. uh, from your artists, or apparently from your artists, from your favorite musician. Uh, and uh, you know, there is not merchandise that they are trying to distribute and allowing the fans to buy. So again, it you know, it's it's not straightforward. It's not easy. Um, and um, at the end of the day, the only way this works is that there is, like I said, there is very tangible, visible value that users get back because you are looking for their time. You are you're trying to win their attention. Mm -hmm. And that doesn't come for free. That is the most priceless thing as a brand that you can ask, which is the time from your customers. There's there's one and and there's there's only two or three other questions I have left, but there's one going back to uh, your time at Gannett. And um, when you transition the company from a news media platform to a digital content subscription marketplace, uh, I'm sure that was, there are many challenges that come when you're, when you're transitioning from a, a news media platform to a subscription marketplace uh, where there, and you mentioned earlier about certain steps you should take, right. And, and the ethos of, of the narrative of, of the brand, are there, are there any particular uh, strategies uh, that at that time were helpful that you use when it came to being able to uh, alter the narrative of 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 a of a particular product. Yeah, that was um, that was a very different type of challenge. It's a hundred year old legacy brand that has so much credibility with you know brand like USA Today. Um, and I was fortunate enough because I sat on the board of directors for two years and then during COVID took on this operating role to to lead marketing and, and strategy, sorry, uh, marketing and strategy for Ganehan. That's my dog in the back. Um, but I think the, um, the, the challenge or what you focus on early on in an opportunity like that, Alejandro, is actually it's more, it's more foundational and fundamental. It is... Um, this is very similar to what New York Times went through, uh, perhaps seven or eight years back. Mm -hmm. This is what Microsoft went through because I read uh, Satya Nadella's book, Hit Refresh. This is literally what Microsoft did to self-transform themselves from you know, a pure operating system in a Windows company to a cloud-based, um, almost SaaS platform. Um, but the biggest... Shift is cultural and mindset. The biggest shift is um, is saying and believing that uh, your future growth is going to come from that direction, which looks very small today. Mm. Whereas this cash cow that you have is really a cash cow today, but that's really not the future. So for legacy uh, media businesses, uh, the Ganesh, the New York Times, and, and many others, uh, print had been the cash cow for decades, right? It was, uh, yep. and that's why it's billions of revenue. But we all know um, the transformation had already happened. The world had already transformed, but the businesses were so big that it was um, it was not easy enough for them to transform with the same pace. But the consumer habits change faster uh, because of the evolution of tech and digital and data that look at the pace at which the world changed during COVID. Mm -hmm. So imagine if that happened in a span of two years, imagine the amount of change that happened in the last 10 to 12 years, but the companies weren't taking that short of a period to transform the entire business model. So it was more, um, it, it was more the challenge to believe and, and cultural. And then of course you build underlying muscle and technology and capabilities, you bring people uh, you bring people who don't come from that category because they are not coming and saying, this is how things are done. They are coming mm. and questioning everything. Right? So during my time there, I hired people from disruptive places like Spotify, you know, Peacock, and uh, and a lot more people who had disrupted other verticals because they would come and they would not bring any baggage. They would right. be ready to take the windows down because they know that these windows don't fit the buildings anymore. 
Um, <laughs> So that's that's what we did. There's a lot of change that we brought on, and and um, of course, it's an incredible brand, and the world needs honest and unbiased information and news more than ever before. And I hope that um, um, that uh, they continue to go down the transformation. And it's you know, the, I'm very excited about watching it from the outside. But yes, that was the thesis. We invested a lot in underlying technology, data. Um, you know, understanding growth, the growth principles, and um, yeah, and bringing a team, surrounding yourself with individuals that came uh, from 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 similar industries already. Uh, when it when it came to like in terms of subscription base or, and what when we're talking about the adapting, right? You mentioned COVID. You mentioned all these things that force companies uh, open up opportunities, force companies to rethink the way they're they're providing a certain service or product to to that customer. What emerging technologies do you believe are already revolutionizing marketing? And is is there is there any in particular where you say, you know, this this is actually something that we've come across that has been really helpful that I'm very excited to continue keeping an eye on to see where, where it can take us. Yeah. I mean, look, I, I think anytime you talk about technology today, um, of course, everyone would say AI and ML and, and everything. And, um, and that's fine. Uh, I honestly don't think that the barrier for marketing today is technology. Uh, I think there's enough technology that's been brought into marketing in the last 20 years. I think the challenge and the barrier for marketing is, is our ability to figure out the application of that technology, the application of data to build experiences um, you know, that will influence and inspire human behavior. So I, yes, of course, we will, you know, we are all um, ingesting what AI can do to, to bring more intelligence, to bring more seamlessness, to bring more speed. Um, but that's that's not where marketing is failing right now, uh, you know, when it does fail. Um, it, it is more, how do you balance serendipity and irrationality with, um, with very direct marketing that drives behavior? How do you balance mm. uh, your need to stay focused on the mission and purpose of who you are and why you exist to begin with, um, with the ability to move the needle and drive profitability, right? Because it can't be either or. You, you can't just focus on brand and not focus on performance and growth. You also can't just focus on performance and growth and ignore the brand or ignore um, you know, that, that foundation. So I think that's the that's the biggest area and improving the incrementality of marketing. How do you get better? How do you shrink the time that it takes you to understand, hey, is it working or is it not working? Mm. You know, because there are a hundred things you could do. How do you pick the five that you're going to do? And when you pick the five, how do you identify very early on? These are the ones where you're getting good signals, but perhaps this isn't working. So let's pivot. So I feel that at least right now, the limiting factor in marketing is more the ability to connect the dots, the ability for um, marketing to be embedded uh, with product, the ability for, and again, caveating all of this by saying marketing is not the same in every type of organization. Mm. The role that marketing plays, the, uh, the impact it has is absolutely influenced and driven by the business model by the category. For example, if you're not direct to consumer, marketing is a king and queen. If you're uh, still a retail-driven consumer package goods company, PNL is run by marketers, you know, by brand managers. That's the the titles I'm assuming are still very much like that. Mm -hmm. Because you have no other growth lever other than great marketing to influence, you know, millions of people who will come and go to the shelf and probably buy your product. Very different from direct-to-consumer CPGs, where it's all about making your unit economics work by selling people online and hoping that you have a great product so they come back. Mm -hmm. Which is very also different from pure technology and product-led companies, where 
the first phase of growth was inherently driven by the product itself. So for marketing to be successful, these are different playbooks, um, different set of challenges. I love that. I love that breakdown. Uh, definitely makes uh, a ton of sense. Mayur, we've come to an end here. Are there any particular, anything else you want to share? Uh, you want to make sure that we cover? Um, it could be any other tips that come to mind, Any anything. You have the microphone, you have an audience. What What's something you would love for them to, to keep in mind, to know? Yes, I think I've shared enough philosophy or we have discussed and debated in a philosophy, Alejandro. But I'm, <laughs> I, I'm pretty confident that your core audience, if these are founders and entrepreneurs, they're one of the, one of the most smart um, and smartest set of people out there in the world. I would say- They wouldn't mind have, hearing that. That's for sure. Yeah, exactly. <laughs> and, and I, I, hey, for whatever it's worth, I've had three startups and two terribly failed. And uh, so I have a lot of respect for anyone who gives it a shot and give it their everything because I know it takes everything you have. Yeah. But I would say if, if you haven't yet, um, dig into crypto. I don't mean invest in crypto. Dig into it because at the end of the day, it's one of the most incredible computer science movements, uh, technology products that is going to change the world, that is already changing the world. Um, where it's taking um, the middle layer out of the most archaic things in the world, which is the concept of money and the financial ecosystem. Um, it is intended to make world a better place, a more inclusive, a more free um, place where the power goes back into the hands of the people, um, where you lean on technology to make decisions with no bias versus leaning on two or three or four centralized powers, whether these are private companies or governments or states. Um, but dig into it, challenge it, learn about it. It's not perfect, not even close. It's just the beginning. But the, ask the question if it's better from what we have seen in the last 100 years. And as entrepreneurs, you guys would know when internet came about, how many challenges we had. When e-commerce came about, how many challenges we had. When mm. email was launched in the 1970s, how many challenges we had. So, but you all can dig into the technology, can dig into the value it's meant to drive. And if you do get interested, then definitely check out Kraken on kraken.com or download the Kraken app um, and give it a shot. I love that. Th thank you, Mayur, for, for your time. Really appreciate it. Love, love you being able to just give back to the founder community and very much appreciate it. Mm -hmm.